In the last video clip, we discussed the general global atmospheric circulation pattern. There are two important modifications to the general pattern that we need to now review. First, the seasonal shift of the pressure and wind zones, and second, monsoons. We have already mentioned that the four pressure zones and three winds move slightly to the north during northern hemisphere summer and slightly to the south during southern hemisphere summer. This makes sense due to the changing location of the sun's vertical rays throughout the year. This textbook diagram shows the seasonal migration of the intertropical convergence zone, ITCZ. Notice that, in general, it fluctuates more over land than in ocean. Why is that? Remember, though, it's not only the ITCZ that fluctuates, and notably the fluctuation of the subtropical high and the westerlies has huge consequences for us in California. We'll study global climate in much more detail in a few weeks, but I'll introduce a few terms here now. California has what's called a Mediterranean climate. It's denoted on this map in red. The Mediterranean climate is actually the smallest of all the climate types in terms of the area of the Earth that it covers. Check it out. Where do you find a Mediterranean climate? Can you figure out what all of those locations in red have in common in terms of their location? Importantly, the Mediterranean climate type is the only climate type that has wet winters and dry summers. Indeed, compared to the most of the rest of the world, California and other locations with the Mediterranean climate is completely bizarre. I know you don't think dry summers are strange, but it is. Most places in the world have wetter summers than winters. For example, I grew up in Minnesota, and the wettest month there is June. Notably, those wet summers that exist in much of the world are a great thing for agriculture. And conversely, our dry summers have mandated that we develop sophisticated water storage and delivery systems to raise our food. We will go into much more detail about the causes and effects of the Mediterranean climate in a few weeks. But for now, let's focus on the major cause of this unique climate type. For most of the year, California and the other Mediterranean climate locations fall within the westerlies. Remember the westerlies are variable winds between 30 and 60 degrees north and south. Indeed, that's where all these Mediterranean climates exist, in the westerlies. And because we're in the westerlies, we get variable weather, including clouds and rain, for much of the year. Indeed, variability of weather is one of the trademarks of being in the westerlies. However, in the summertime, the subtropical high that is normally right about 30 degrees north and south moves up to about 35 degrees. And so in the summertime, we are under the influence of the subtropical high. High pressure means descending air and thus no clouds and no rain. This same phenomenon takes place in the southern hemisphere at about 35 degrees on the western margin of the southern hemisphere continents. Cool, eh? So the seasonal shifting of the pressure zones and winds causes the Mediterranean climates to have variable and sometimes wet weather most of the year, but to have distinctly dry summers. In a couple of weeks, we'll continue our discussion of climate types and learn that our Mediterranean climate is fundamentally responsible for much of the food crops we think of as Californian. What crops might those be? Can you think of things we have in common with other Mediterranean climate places around the world? Stay tuned. Next, just a reminder to be sure to check out the seasonal pressure and precipitation patterns animation in the Master in Geography study area for Chapter 5. Indeed, there's several animations, 
that are posted under Chapter 5, and I encourage you to view them all at least once. Next, we'll look at the second modification of the general atmospheric circulation pattern, monsoons. First, a simple definition. A monsoon is a seasonal reversal of wind. The major monsoon areas are shown on the map shown here. You can see that Af Africa, Southern Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia are the places we typically think of monsoons. Though there is a small monsoon effect also in the southwestern part of the United States. The most intense and well-known monsoon region of the world is Southern Asia. Check out these figures from your textbook. For the winter and much of the year, the prevailing winds are the northeast trade winds, as you would expect, given the latitude of this region. Winds blow from the northeast, and then in the summer, the winds reverse and come from the southwest, bringing warm, moisture-rich air over the region, and as the air rises over the highlands and the mountains, the air cools, water in the air condenses, clouds form, and precipitation ensues. Indeed, massive quantities of rain are dumped on the region here in the summertime due to the monsoons. And this area actually relies on these summer rains for agriculture. You can see the same phenomena on these maps here. Can you find the, mon the monsoon? So why does this occur? Why do the, some of the winds, the trade winds in this case, simply reverse? Study the two maps shown here from figure 5.16 in your textbook and find the subtropical high cells around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south in January. Notice in particular how intense the subtropical high is in Central Asia. Indeed, this cell represents the highest pressures on the map. Does that make sense? It should. What happens to temperature in the winter in the interior of a continent? Remember that temperatures in the continental interiors are generally warmer in the summer and colder in the winter because land heats up and cools down faster and to a greater extent than water. So in the winter time, Central Asia here is likely very cold. So how will this fact about temperature affect pressure? And how will it affect winds? Well, we know that the cold surface temperatures here can create a high pressure cell. We discussed that earlier in this week's video clips. And then this intense high pressure cell of course, is going to help drive the Northeast trades. Now look at the July map. What is the same and what has changed? You can see that the subtropical high pressure cells still exist over the oceans. But they have shifted northward a bit, as we would expect. Now look where the subtropical and high in Southern Asia used to be. In the same location, there now exists an extremely low, low pressure cell. What happened? What happens to temperature in the continental interior in the summertime? Hopefully you said the continental interiors heat up faster and to a greater extent than the oceans. So how does this temperature rise affect pressure? Well, as the air warms, it expands, becomes less dense, so it rises, and that moving of molecules away from the Earth's surface creates a low pressure cell. Indeed, what was once a characteristically high, high pressure cell up here has actually transformed now into a fairly low, low-pressure cell. 
Now let's look where the northeast trade winds are supposed to be. Where are they? They have completely reversed and are now flowing from the southwest. A seasonal reversal of winds, a monsoon. Air is still flowing from high to low pressure, like always. But now that warm, moist air is being drawn inland towards the inland low pressure. And the air is carried over India and Bangladesh, etc., and up towards the Himalayas. And as the air rises over the highlands, the topographic barriers, it cools, clouds form, and rain in massive quantities is dumped on southern Asia. Notably, as we noted previously, India and the entire region relies on the monsoons for irrigation of their crops. When the monsoon fails in El Nino years, production declines considerably and there is famine. So remember, monsoons occur in the summer months as a response to summer heating within the continental interiors, which destroys the subtropical high and seasonally reverses the winds. This occurs in Southern Asia, Southeast Asia, Eastern Asia, and also Western and Central Africa, and even a bit in the American Southwest. Notably, this is yet another example of a region of the world that gets considerably more rain in the summer than in the winter. Again, here in California, we're strange. Dry summers are a strange phenomenon. Thus far, we have discussed large-scale pressure and wind systems that make up the global atmospheric circulation pattern. However, there's many smaller-scale winds that also influence specific regions. Localized wind systems are very common and result from local pressure gradients that develop in response to contrasting temperatures or different topographic conditions. We'll briefly mention some of these localized wind systems here, but you should also be careful to review them in your textbook. First, one that definitely affects us locally, sea breezes and land breezes. We name these winds, just as all winds, from the location they're coming from. So if sea breeze is coming from the sea, and a land breeze will be coming from the land. Both of these systems are essentially just convection cells. Let's look how they work. First, a sea breeze. During the day, the land near an ocean heats up faster and to a greater extent than the nearby ocean. This heating up causes the air to expand and rise, creating a localized low pressure. Thus, the higher pressure air out over the water is drawn towards the low pressure. Again, winds flow from high to low pressure, and we get a sea breeze, in the, perhaps in the late afternoon. We can contrast that with a land breeze. At night, the land cools down faster and to a greater extent than the water, creating a higher pressure situation on the land than the water. And so the winds reverse, and we have wind flowing from the land towards the water in the night. Valley breezes and mountain breezes operate in much the same way. And again, they're named from the location the wind is coming from. During the day in a mountainous region, you can imagine that the, the upper, the southern face slopes can start to heat up. They're facing towards the sunlight and maybe even their slope is such that they're getting rather direct rays from the sun. As these southern slopes heat up, the air expands and rises, creating a localized low, low pressure, and air streams up the mountain from high pressure to low pressure. This is most common in the summer times during the day, and it can even create clouds as the air rises up and cools, and rainfall in the afternoons in the mountains. At nighttime, especially in the winter, you might get mountain breezes. The high elevation exposed rock here cools off greatly due to radiative cooling. You get a localized high pressure, 
and the wind streams down the mountain to the low pressure regions below.